Today we are going to do the webinar on obstructive sleep apnea and its cardiovascular outcomes. I, Dr. Josna, working as a professor of cardiology and I am the Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences. I invite Dr. Rama. Thank you. I am Dr. Rama Gornini and uh, I am an adjunct associate professor of neurology from Northwestern University in Chicago. I recently moved back to India about eight months back. I'm currently uh, the director of Amrit Sleep Clinic in Tripati. Actually, we thought it is better to discuss about the case and the relevance to this, why we have to talk about the abstractus sleep apnea now. I'm, today, I'm presenting a case of 55-year-old female patient came with exertional breathlessness since two years with intermittent palpitations and fatigue. There is no history of classical angina or synco or paradismal nocturnal dyspnea. On examination, her height is about 55 centimeters with a weight of 90 kg with a BMA of 37.5 kg per square meter, which is definitely on the higher side. Vital examination showed that pulse rate is higher with a BP on the higher side and systolic blood pressure is about 180 by the diastolic of 100 millimeters of mercury. Cardiovascular examination and respiratory system examination is absolutely normal. Electrocardiogram showed normal sinus rhythm without any aesthetic abnormalities. So also echocardiogram which is not revealing any regional one motion abnormalities with a good biventricular function but constant LVH probably secondary to the hypertension. Because of uh, unexplained breathlessness, we wanted to evaluate for the coronaries and which demonstrated single vessel disease that is proximal LED showed 90% stenosis. Subsequently, we did PTCA to the LED. For four months, patient is absolutely okay, but again, she came back with the same complaints as before, that is significant SOB and palpitations. At the time, clinical examination showed again mild tachycardia with still on the higher BP. The patient is already on three antihypertensive drugs with a creatinine 1.1, thyroid hormone levels are normal. A renal Doppler evaluation showed there is no renal artery stenosis. So also urinary VMA test is also negative. So we were wondering what is the cause for this uncontrolled hypertension. So at this stage we were thinking is this is a stent thrombosis which is very frequent in the early phases of intervention but it can happen subsequently also. But we expect that to be acute presentation of chest, chest pain but not as a subacute onset of breathlessness. Then second possibility we are thinking are we missing any other history? What are the investigation to order the next? Is that TMT? a nuclear scan for the inducible ischemia. As we know that once a person has a coronary artery disease, more likely to have the coronary events. So we are considering those. But we are in dilemma, is that really we are missing any other diagnosis? I think if you take the clue of the BMI of a 37.5 cases, then we started thinking is this is obstructive sleep apnea, which we are not paying much attention and before considering the revascularization of the coronary arteries. To tell about why we have to talk about this obstructive sleep apnea is one thing is it is un unrecognized in many, con many situations because we are not suspecting it and the second one is it is not properly treated and this leads to the significant cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. That's the reason we are giving an importance to this condition and we are discussing today. The obstructive sleep apnea is a common sleep related breathing disorder characterized by repetitive episodes of apnea or reduced inspiratory airflow due to upper airway obstruction during the sleep. The association between obstructive sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease and the potential impact of the obstructive sleep apnea specific therapy and cardiovascular outcomes are we are going to discuss in today's webinar. And another reason uh, why we wanted to talk about uh, obstructive sleep apnea related cardiovascular diseases are because it is associated with uh, a significant cardiovascular diseases 
which will culminate in the morbidity and mortality up to the patient. These are mainly, they can manifest as an uncontrolled hypertension, both systemic as well as the pulmonary hypertension and can lead to heart failure and can cause a sudden cardiac death and exaggerate the cardiac arrhythmia and it can predispose to the screw as well as myocardial infarction. And especially the sudden death during the sleep is common in obstructive sleep apnea patients, of course, and very rarely it can produce venous thromboembolism. Now I request Dr. Rama to tell about the epidemiology and clinical presentation and evaluation of this obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is a group of disorder, uh, is a, one of the diagnoses that I, that's part of a group of disorders known as sleep-related breathing disorders as classified by the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. Other um, sleep-related breathing disorders include a milder form of obstructive sleep apnea known as increased upper airway resistance. And within obstructive sleep apnea, there's both adult and pediatric sleep apnea, depending on the age group. There's also central sleep disorder breathing and the sleep-related hypoventilation syndromes. For this talk, we're going to uh, concentrate on the adult sleep apnea. So the, what is the epidemiology? There's various studies that, that show that overall uh, in the U.S. population, uh, the epidemiology is about 5%. But depending on the age group that you're looking at and the severity of the sleep apnea, it can vary. For instance, in the Wisconsin cohort study of middle-aged individuals, where only individuals aged approximately 30 to 60 to 65 were seen, when you look at the mild sleep apnea, it's up to almost 17%, and moderate to severe sleep apnea in this age group is about 7%. And so what about the sleep OSA, or obstructive sleep apnea in India? In, uh, in one, one study, uh, at All India Institute where they looked again at middle-aged individuals aged uh, 30 to 65 in the semi-urban population, which included uh, um, both the mid middle class and the lower uh, socioeconomic uh, groups. There was almost 9.3% uh, in this community of sleep apnea. And sleep apnea was diagnosed by an apnea hypopnea index of 5 or greater. The other thing is the association of sleep apnea. Does it have the same consequences as in the Western society? When they looked at the association of sleep apnea with metabolic syndrome, there was metabolic syndrome was uh, seen in almost 79% of these patients. Is this uh, is age specific, like it is known to occur in the middle age and the elderly, or it is known to happen in the children also? It can happen in all age groups. It's definitely uh, more uh, prevalent when you look at the mid, uh, middle aged and older patients. But you can see it in all age groups. Even in children, you can see sleep apnea, but uh, the causes may be different. And when you come to the adolescent or the childhood, when you see uh, children with um, the pediatric age group associated with childhood obesity, you can see sleep apnea in them. But even in the non-obese, children with Down syndrome, because of the large tongue and reduced uh, space in the airway, as well as the cleft lip and palate and midfacial deformities, you can see sleep apnea in these children also. And when you see sleep apnea in uh, young children associated with adrenal tonsillar problems, how do we check for Malampati score? You ask the patient to open their mouth wide, put out their tongue, and open it as wide as they can, and then shine a light into the eye to see how open it is. And if you see, this is class one. Class two, it's not a perfect picture. If the uvula goes behind the tongue, and but you can still see the back of the throat, that's class two. Three is there significant narrowing, and four is when you can't see the back of the throat at all. Class three and four are both associated with increased risk of sleep apnea. And if you look at the upper airway anatomy here, Basically, this is a side view. This is the soft palate. This is the uvula. And here's the tongue. And this is the back of the throat. This is the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and laryngopharynx. So whenever there's a large tongue and a lot of soft palate and crowd, and there's crowding behind, when a person lays down, normally in a normal person, when they breathe air in, as you see, it's going to go through the nose, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and to the larynx and go to oxygenate the deoxygenated blood coming into the lungs. 
before it goes to the heart. However, when you have crowding here, and when they're sleeping, particularly when they're on their back, you're going to have periods where there's collapse of the soft tissues towards the back of the throat. And if there's partial collapse or total collapse, you're going to disrupt the amount of air or totally occlude the air from um, passing through. And during these times, there's no oxygen passing through. So what's going to happen is the blood passing through the lungs is not going to be sufficiently oxygenated. And you're sending partially oxygenated uh, and poorly oxygenated blood to the heart. And when this happens, this is a big stress on the heart, and that heart detects this. So the person is going to have awakening to start breathing again. So is there any level of hypoxia is required to stimulate the central nervous system to again start the respiration? Um, you know that that's not clear. Uh, the person does wake up, but sometimes even without hypoxemia, just with collapse, uh, partial collapse of the airway and reduction of airway, you can see that there's arousals. Uh, this is known as upper airway resistance because uh, to score a uh, reduction, you know, cessation of airflow as apnea, uh, you don't necessarily need a desaturation, but for the partial uh, airflow cessation hypopnea, you need a minimum of 3% uh, desaturation by most cri lab criteria. But sometimes even without this, you'll see uh, arousal. So it's not the hypoxemia is not necessary. So now that we've talked about the history, the examination, what to look at, sometimes though, I mentioned about four questions you can ask. Do you snore? Do you stop breathing? Do you wake up gasping for breath? Are you sleepy during the daytime? Uh, you can ask this, but sometimes if you want some type of pre-screening done. Remember in the cardiology clinics, there's a chance, depending on the type of patients you see, almost 50% or above may have sleep apnea. So the, some of the screening tools you can keep in the clinic um, uh, that, can be that can be administered even by nurses include the stop bank or the Berlin questionnaire to screen for sleep apnea and the upward sleepiness scale to screen for sleepiness. Both the stop bank and the Berlin have high sensitivity where they will pick up sleep apnea if it's present, but the specificity tends to be lower. When you add upward sleepiness scale to measure for sleepiness, the two put together, the specificity will increase if the uh, stop banger Berlin picks it up and the patient is sleepy. However, the caveat to this is in the Indian population, the upward sleepiness scale may not detect the amount of sleepiness because of the type of questions it asks. Out of the two, the stop bang and the Berlin, the stop bang is much more simple to administer within the clinic. You can also administer the stop without the bang, and there's separate scoring criteria for that. So I'm not going to go through each question, but depending on the number of yeses, uh, if they answer three to four questions correct, that's intermediate chance of having sleep apnea, and five to eight is a high chance of having sleep apnea. This is the upward sleepiness score, and the reason I say there's limitation probably is that a lot of these situations uh, may not be applicable to our society, like sitting in active in public place or theater. Uh, you know, most a lot of people don't go to the theater anymore, and they may not sit active in a in inactive in a public place, even a meeting. And other things like uh, in a car while stopped, they may not be driving. Uh, they, uh, you know, sitting quietly without alcohol, they may not understand that because they don't drink alcohol to start with. So there's a lot of limitations to this questionnaire. But if you administer the stop thing and there's a high intermediate or high probability and the patient is sleepy, then you can strongly suspect sleep apnea. So once the suspicion is there, then how do you diagnose sleep apnea? The gold standard for diagnosis is a sleep study. Uh, and there's different levels of sleep study. Level one and there's level two or three. So the, this is an example. On, over here is the level one study, and the level one study is performed in the lab while the technologist is observing the patient sleeping. So this means the technologist can intervene if the study is not being conducted properly, or they can titrate the patient with CPAP if needed. So going back, see here is that they're recording the EEG, the eye movements, the airflow, and the breathing parameters. Whereas the level three study, they're recording only the breathing, 
They're also recording the, the uh, breathing movement, the airflow, the breathing movements, and the oxygen saturation. So it's more of a cardiorespiratory study. For patients with uncomplicated sleep apnea, this may be enough. But usually, currently, the, di uh, the recommendations in patients with underlying cardiopulmonary disease really should have a level one study. Because with the level three, you can't tell if it's an obstructive apnea, if it's a central apnea, or if there's hyperventilation. Level two study is all of this. Only, the only difference is that it's not being monitored by a technologist. The problem is uh, the figures are giving an impression as if it is not a stimulating and natural sleep in the house. That's, so yeah. Is that gives a good information about uh, um, the disease? You know, it is hard to sleep with all of this. And when you, if you try to simulate a home environment and make people feel that they're really not in a hospital, it's a home environment, it definitely makes it easier. However, still, they have all these wires that's, uh, uh, that's tying them down that still makes it hard. But in, still, the amount of sleep that they will get will probably be enough to tell if they have sleep apnea and also the type of sleep apnea they're having. Suppose if this sleep study comes as a negative, means there is no hypoxia, apnea uh, ratios are not very significant. Can you confidently rule it out obstructive sleep apnea? You can, provided that they they actually slept at night. There's some right. people that don't sleep. Yeah. The other thing is uh, sometimes if a patient has the apnea is only when they're on their back, but they didn't sleep on their back at all, you may miss the diagnosis. Uh, and some people have it only during REM sleep, and if they have disturbed sleep and didn't get any REM, you may underestimate the degree of sleep apnea. But for the most part, if it's an appropriate study and uh, there's no apneas, hypopneas, or hypoxemia, you can pretty confidently rule out that they have sleep apnea. Is there anything like extended study? Because in cardiology, in arrhythmias, we are not able to detect it. Mm -hmm. We will do the recording for the instead of the 24 hours, we do for seven days. Like I that, is there any extended studies that are um, helpful in this? Not for st sleep study. And it would be very difficult, difficult to do the sleep study for that long because they have to be asleep. Yeah. You can do it on more than one day, but the thing is to record a sleep study, they have to be asleep and they can't sleep for more than seven or eight hours. The so. drugs that can induce the sleep can be given to the patient to do this study? Uh, no, because uh, that's the artificial sleep and it's not going to simulate their normal sleep and what's going on, so that's probably not recommended. Um, you can do multiple night studies, but uh, doing continuous sleep recording is probably not suggested. So this is a level one study, and this is the EEG. So here what you're seeing is, see, this is the breathing, and the person has partial breathing, and here they stop breathing completely. And here's the oxygen saturation. The oxygen goes down when they stop breathing. And here, see, this is the snoring. And during the pauses in respiration, the snoring goes away. In addition, every time they stop breathing in the EEG, they're having an arousal. So this is what sleep apnea looks like in a level one study. This is a level three study. And, uh, please, can we go back? Sure. How is the EEG is going to be at that uh, hypoxia is occurring the tachycardia occurs? Or not much of change? Here, you don't really see much of a chance. You can have bradycardia, tachycardia, which we'll discuss in a little while when we talk about the heart rhythms. But in general here, you may not see it, obviously, in everybody. There's certain software in the sleep studies that can detect heart rate variability uh, through sensitive measures, and you may see the heart rate variability on that. But at least in this study, we're not seeing much variability. Heart rate variability is a very important factor following an MI or acute coronary event in uh, cardiovascular disease patients. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Is this is going to alter the heart rate variability? It's it, going to narrow down it? it? It may. So if a patient has an MI and they have sleep apnea, when they're sleeping, they're going to have hypoxemia. That's going to put further stress on the already damaged heart. So the chances of arrhythmogenesis is going to be much higher in these patients. And I think I, there are studies that have shown this. So here's a level three study. Level three study is uh, limited. And uh, it, shouldn't, it can only be used in patients with uncomplicated, uh, since when you, young, healthy patients, when you suspect uh, sleep apnea, or even older people, as long as they don't have underlying uh, unstable cardiorespiratory illness. Um, 
any cardiopulmonary illness should have a level one study is what's suggested, but I think if they have stable heart disease and if you want to start with a level three study, that may also be appropriate. But here you see the reduction in airflow and the oxygen desaturations associated with this. So as you see, in some people this may be enough. The advantages of this is they can take it home, they can sleep at home with it. And the other thing is the because it doesn't have to be done in the um, hospital, the rent of the hospital, the charges, the, the technologist staying up all night to perform the study, all of this cost can be eliminated. The disadvantage is during a level one study, if a definitive diagnosis is made in the first two to three hours, CPAP titration can be initiated, and you can't really do that with a portable study. So the racial predisposition, uh, Asians uh, have, as we already discussed, Asians because of the uh, shorter cranial base, the most acute uh, cranial base flexure, and other uh, anatomy, anatomic features that increase risk for sleep apnea, even with lower BMI, and with the next circumference being about roughly equal. So. What are the treatment modalities are available? Is that is uh, medical therapy is uh, helpful or CPAP is a well-known uh, treatment of the choice? So please can you elaborate on that. Okay. So till now we've talked about uh, when to suspect sleep apnea based on the history and exam and what tools are available to diagnose it and including the sleep, sleep study. So once you've diagnosed a sleep study, the there are several treatments available. So there are certain medical treatments that were tried, uh, certain medications to stimulate respiration, but none of these have shown a, a very positive result. So the gold standard for treatment for moderate sleep apnea, moderate to severe sleep apnea, and also mild sleep apnea when they have underlying hypertension, diabetes, or heart disease and other conditions, is still CPAP therapy. However, for patients with mild, uncomplicated sleep apnea without these illnesses, other treatment, uh, treatments are also available. And even before that, if it's only mild sleep apnea, they don't have uh, any of these comorbid illnesses, they don't have di uh, daytime sleepiness, it's not necessary to treat. But if the snoring is bothersome and some, or something else is bothersome, other treatment options include dental evaluation for mandibular advancement therapy or oral appliance therapy, ENT surgery, uh, which can be uh, both laser-assisted uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty as well as uvulopalatopharyngeoplasty and certain other surgical procedures that, have, uh, that are being used. And there's also positional therapy if the, uh, most of the sleep apnea is mostly on the back. Um, let's talk about CPAP therapy. This is what CPAP therapy looks like. And here's a CPAP machine. This is the ResMed uh, S9 machine. With, and this creates positive airway pressure, which is connected by a hose. So there's air under positive pressure, and the, which goes through the hose, through the mask, through the nasopharynx, through the, and through the airway that I've shown earlier. These are the, some of the different premier CPAP devices available now in India. In addition to this, there's also, so here's the ResMed, here's the Philips Respironics, this is Weinemann. There's also Devilbis, there's a, um, a Fisher Paykel as well as some others. And there's two types of machine. One is manual CPAP where you titrate the patient and come up with a fixed pressure. These are less costly. However, the disadvantages is you need a second sleep study to titrate them. Auto CPAP, the advantage is that uh, you can uh, um, set a low range and a high range and, titrate, and uh, the titration can be done at home. Uh, and you can do it over several days. You can fix the pressure after that or you can leave it in a smaller range or a larger range where the pressure continues to change based on the need. So these are the two ways where the titration can be done and the patient can be treated. But many of the time, the patients are not compliant with the CPAP. We know that it gives a very good response and that too we document during the sleep study that uh, giving a CPAP improves the patient's symptoms. Mm -hmm. Still, the patient doesn't feel the comfortable. Yeah. So mainly that I think it is because of the face mask which is giving a more obstruction. 
So, is there any modifications or uh, anything can be done for to be a more friendly sleep? There, there are some patients, believe it or not, that sleep so well once the CPAP is put on that they've. Uh, I remember the first patient uh, when I slept overnight to watch him be titrated. He woke up and kissed the technologist. He felt so good the next day. Uh, so there's some people that feel great will never sleep without it, but there are a lot of uh, there's some a lot of people take some time getting used to it, and some people uh, have a lot of, may never get used to it if the doctor uh, or the techno there's not a qualified doctor or technologist who understands these problems there to help them. So what are some of these problems? Number one is the problem with the mask. They may not feel comfortable with the mask. Some patients may feel comfortable with a certain mask uh, when they first try it, but when they try to sleep, it may move out of place. So number one, it's important to educate them about how to use the mask, how to put it on, and also let them see various different types of masks, understand what's bothering them to find a mask they're comfortable with. The second is the pressure. You want to make sure the pressure is enough, not too much, and sometimes, in some cases, not too little. There's some patients, if they need, if they have sleep apnea only on their back, they may not need a pressure at all when they're not on their back. So using AutoPAP in these patients uh, will be helpful. There's some patients with nasal congestion and dryness, and uh, they may complain, they may say the mask, the problem is with the mask or the pressure, but the actual problem is with nasal congestion and dryness. This can be treated with the um, steroid, nasal steroids to reduce the blo nasal blockage. It can also be treated with Neomed sinus rinse to help it reduce the inflammation and to keep the, the keep it from drying. Uh, or gel nephi can also be tried with the iodine-free salt and water using the neti pot. Some patients feel claustrophobic, and for them, it's a process of desensitizing them and getting them to feel more comfortable with both the pressure and the mask. There's patients that swallow air with the CPAP and have difficulty and complain of abdominal bloating. It's important to recognize this. These patients can be treated by putting them on an autopath. And also, a lot of people's just a cognitive perception. I've stopped seeing this in the U.S. recently, but when I first started practicing, the whole idea of sleeping with a mask was so different from what they grew up with. The only people they saw with the mask are patients in ICU. But uh, in the last uh, one and a half decades that I've practiced sleep medicine in the U.S., this had com considerably came down with the newer CPAP machines, the newer masks, and the more acceptability. But I'm finding the same problem now in India, now that I come. The whole idea of sleeping with a mask is just so different for them that I'm having a lot of difficulty, you know, educating them about the need to use CPAP and the fact that they can comfortably sleep with the CPAP. You're talking about this mask discomfort. So mm -hmm. you can use the different mask suits to them. Yes. But uh, the distributor will give the, the mask they can try, and if it is not advisable, he will change it. Or, uh, um, what is the cost involved in okay. using the different mask for the, to know the comfortness? Okay. You know, see, use of CPAP and changing masks is a big problem in India because uh, most patients in India don't have medical insurance. The cost of CPAP and the masks are high. As far as I know, all CPAP and all masks are currently being uh, imported from other countries. There's no local uh, uh, production of CPAP machines, masks, or uh, the hoses or any of the, any of the, any of the things that we need for this treatment. Uh, the other, uh, yeah, and the other problem is even the patients who have medical insurance, the CPAP is not covered by most insurances. There are a few central government schemes and that may cover it, but majority of insurances aren't covering it. So the cost is a big problem. Even the masks itself, to change it, it can cost up to 6,000 rupees. So this is not a small problem. In addition to the difficulty in uh, the idea of sleeping with a mask, the cost is a big issue. And I, at this point, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know how to handle this unless we start potentially producing our own CPAP Probably machines. because you have the communication with the yeah. companies. Yeah, you can demand them that when the patient requires you have to, they have to do it a comfortable mask. Probably you yeah. can ask them to do yeah. that from the you company know, side. Each, each company, I think we need to communicate with them and ask them to spend time 
in finding a comfortable mask. But even in the US when we did this, we used to use only the companies that did this and not use the companies that wasn't, weren't doing this. However, even there at the end, because of the tenders placed for the Medicare insurance, we were forced to work with just a few companies for Medicare and face the problem that they weren't spending time with the patients. But even when everything is done, sometimes the patient, when they start using it, they may still find out that the mask that they selected isn't appropriate. So the cost, finding a good mask and the cost, um, they're both uh, very significant issues right now that I think as a com community, we need to think of how to deal with this. Okay. Is there any varieties of the CPAP? We heard so much about yeah. uh, humidification and uh, manual versus uh, auto CPAP. So like I said, uh, uh, already mentioned there is a manual CPAP and an auto titrating CPAP and we discussed the difference. So what are other, some of the other features available with the CPAP, uh, with the positive airway pressure machines uh, to make the patient feel more comfortable and address their different needs? One is reducing the pressure. See, when the patient inhales, it's not as much of a problem. Exhaling with, against the pressure becomes more of a problem. So the newer machines have something known as EPR and expiratory pressure relief. So when they breathe out, the pressure goes down a little bit to make it easier for them to breathe out. And uh, for resonant machines, this is known as EPR. For restaurantics machines, this is known as flex. And with other machines, uh, I'm, I'm sure they all have it and they have different names for it. The other thing is uh, whenever we sold a CPAP machine in, in the US, having uh, um, a humidifier, a heated humidifier was mandatory for them because of the dry climate and the need for humidifying the air that goes in to prevent nasal dryness. However, in India, because of the humid uh, climate, not all patients may need it. There are some machines that come with a humidifier attached. Others you may need to purchase it separately. Then there's bi-level CPAP, where there's, uh, there's a different pressure when you inhale and a totally different pressure when you exhale. And this is different from the end expiratory pressure relief. Bi-level may be required when you need very high pressures in CPAP. It may also be required in patients with hypoventilation syndromes to increase the time and inspiration and in improve their ventilation at night. This, uh, this is necessary in patients with neuromuscular conditions leading to hypoventilation, you know, obesity, hypoventilation, and other conditions. Uh, Bi-level uh, uh, PAP or um, adaptive servo ventilation may also be required when you have complex sleep apnea or develop central sleep apneas when you're sleeping. It was uh, also recommended for chain strokes respiration but whether it really um, makes a difference in the patient and the, uh, the study showing that may actually increase mortality in these patients uh, uh, raised some concerns. So at least the ResMed uh, took the, its servo ventilation off the market. Is that this auto titration is possible with the bi-level CPAP also? Yes, it is. It's a, you can have a, a auto BiPAP. Okay. Uh, till now we discussed much uh, about the mechanism, clinical evaluation and uh, man management and uh, I wanted to know the, what are the cardiovascular manifestations of the obstructive sleep apnea and what is the mechanism behind apnea. Okay. So we talked about some of the cardiovascular consequences of sleep apnea. So let's discuss the uh, mechanisms behind it. One is uh, uh, during when a person stops breathing in their sleep, there's several things that happens. One, there's an alteration of blood gases, there's arousals, and there's changes in intrathoracic pressure, and all three of these can independently contribute to the cardiovascular consequences. Let's start with alteration of blood gases or hypoxemia. Hypoxemia, the drug in general, now we're not talking about sleep apnea in particular, but hypoxemia in general, the direct effects of it on the heart because uh, it can cause myocardial ischemia both by reducing myocardial oxygen delivery and increasing the demand of the heart, uh, increasing the demand by the heart. Uh, so when there's myocardial ischemia, this can re result in nocturnal angina, it can lead to MI. It can also result in 
arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death because of the pressure being put on the heart. And it can lead in time to diastolic dysfunction due to the reduced cardiac uh, contractility. So those are the direct effects. There's also a lot of indirect effects. The indirect effects are through the activation of transcription uh, hypoxia or transcription factors, hypoxia inducible factor one and nuclear factor KB. Because of these factors, there's an increase in production of endothelin one, vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet derived growth factor, and adhesion molecules. In addition, there's a suppression of endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Combination of all of this is going to lead to vasoconstriction, inflammation, and coagulation, none of which is good uh, in the uh, cardiac vessels. So the result of all of this is endothelial dysfunction. Now when you have intermittent hypoxia is what's seen in patients with sleep apnea, because when they stop breathing, they have hypoxemia, and then they start breathing, and they have uh, uh, reoxygenation. So this hypoxemia reoxygenation, um, when this occurs, all the same effects of uh, hypoxemia, both the direct and indirect consequences, can be seen. But in addition, because of the hypoxemia reoxygenation, you tend to see free radical species formed, and these free radical species can lead to biochemical injury and oxidative stress. So the effects of intermittent hypoxemia can actually be more deleterious than hypoxemia itself. So the endothelial dysfunction and the oxidative stress caused by this obstructive sleep apnea may contribute to worsening of atherosclerosis, atherothrombosis, and left ventricular dysfunction. So now let's talk about the arousals or disruption in sleep. When, so when this happens, there's shifter to lighter stages of sleep or the patient may have a um, wake up completely. So during these times, there's an elevation of nocturnal sympathetic nerve activity during these arousals or shifts of sleep stages. Uh, so when this happens, uh, there's an elevation of nocturnal blood pressure. So normally the blood pressure and heart rate should go down when a person is asleep. This is known as nocturnal dipping. So now these patients become non-dippers because uh, there's a, not only does the blood pressure not go down, it may actually go up. There may also be an elevation in heart rate during the arousals. And because of the nighttime sympathetic increase, may also carry to the daytime. Daytime hypertension and daytime elevation of heart rate can also be seen. So what are the cardiovascular consequences of the increased sympathetic nerve activity? There's increase of systemic vascular resistance. This leads to LV afterload. And because of increased venoconstriction, there's an increase in uh, right ventricular preload. In addition, increased myocardial contractility is seen. This leads to left ventricular hypertrophy, cardio, tachycardia, as well as arrhythmia. And uh, finally, there's an increase in myocardial norepinephrine release leading to myocyte toxicity as well as apoptosis. And finally, let's talk about the negative intrathoracic uh, pressure changes that's seen. So when a person uh, uh, breathes out against a closed airway, what's going to happen is there's an increase in intra-abdominal pressure, but there's a large increase in negative intrathoracic pressure. Dur during both obstructive apnea and hypopnea, what happens? Because of this increase in the negative intrathoracic pressure, the transmural pressure gradient in the intravascular structures increase. So the pressure between the inside of the aorta compared to the outside of the aorta becomes increased. Similarly, this occurs in the pulmonary vascular bread, as well as the cardiac atria and the ventricles. And because of this, there is an increase in myocardial wall tension, as well as the pressure in the stru uh, structures mentioned. And there's also an increase in oxygen consumption in the myocardial wall and the vascular walls. So um, another thing that happens